Hello, programmers. This is part four of the discussion that covers the topic of polymorphism as used by C++ classes and objects. If you have not already seen parts one, two, and three yet, I recommend watching them first. They provide an introduction to objects, classes, encapsulation, and inheritance. In this video, I won't be discussing parts of code already covered in the previous discussion. If you are watching this as a video, links to the other parts of the discussion should be available in the comments section on YouTube. The previous discussion covered how OOP inheritance can be used to create a base class and several derived classes from it. The derived classes inherit all the public and protected data and member methods that the base class makes available. We are also able to show how an array filled with book objects can be created and a separate array of shirt objects can be created. But those objects were not able to be placed in a single array because all elements in an array must be the same data type. By implementing polymorphism, we'll be able to create an array with the data type of the base class and place in it objects of any of its derived classes. Then I can use one array that holds all the different types of items I want to sell. I can also have only one array to hold the items in the shopping cart. One array to rule them all. By implementing polymorphism with inheritance, I will be able to create arrays from the base class item and put any object in those arrays that are derived from class item. The first thing I want to look at is the item list array that holds the inventory of items and compare it to the array of book three objects from the previous discussion. The book list in the previous project was only able to hold book three objects because every element in the array must be the same data type. The same happens with the array for shirt objects. In our new polymorphism project, the data type for the item list array is item star, which means that the array is actually holding pointers to the books and shirts, not the books and shirt objects themselves. A pointer holds a memory address. This works because every element in the item list array is the same data type, an item pointer. We need to use pointer operators when working with data or methods that belong to items in the item list array. The new operator returns the memory address of an object that it instantiates. For example, the first element in the array has new book open parentheses 1176 comma quote Ulysses quote comma quote James Joyce quote comma 32.95 comma 16 close parentheses the new operator instantiates a book object in memory returns its memory address which is then saved in the first element in the item list array of pointers another difference in the code between the previous discussion and this discussion is how I arrived at the size of the array the previous discussion computed the size of the book list array by dividing the size of the array by the size of an individual element. In the updated program, item list size is being read from the member method item colon colon get item count. This means that a new method needs to be added to class item that keeps track of the number of objects being instantiated from base class item. There are some things I want to show about objects when discussing the getItemCount method that belongs to the item class. Let's start with a discussion of changes to the item.h file that contains class item. Because this is the final version of the project, I am no longer putting a number after the file names or class names. The class item is declared as it is shown, not class item 4. When an object is instantiated, each object gets its own copy of its non-static member data. In this new version of class item, I see a new private member data static int item count. Because it is a static data, it is automatically initialized to zero. 
Looking at the getters, there's a static int get item count, and the static keyword is there because it is accessing static data. It is the get item count method that is used in the main program to get the count of items in the item list array. This won't work if additional items are declared that are not part of the array because the item count will no longer accurately represent the count of the items in the array. I just wanted to show how a piece of static data can be used. We can see the code that increments item count when we look at the item.cpp file. The only other thing that I see is that the toString method is listed as virtual. The virtual keyword is really the key to polymorphism. This gives a derived subclass the ability to have its own toString method that can override the base class method of the same name. Here is an example of four item objects. Each object has its own copy of the non-static member data. Because item list count is declared static, there is only one copy shared among all objects. It is located as part of the class definition instead of being part of each object that is instantiated. The main program has the code int item list size equal item colon colon get item count open close parentheses semicolon to get the value from item list count. Since static data is shared between all of the objects, it does not belong to any one object. The item colon colon get item count open close parentheses uses the class's name and the scope resolution operator colon colon instead of using the name of an object. Item.cpp has the implementation code for class item. References to item 3 have been changed to item in this completed project. Inside the code for the constructors, item count is incremented each time an item object is instantiated. This is how we can keep track of the number of items. The getter code get item count returns the item count used in main. Only three things are updated in making the final version of book.h. One. The three is removed from the file name and class name. Two, the class book now includes the keyword final, which identifies the class as a leaf node, preventing any other classes from being derived from it. The keyword final was introduced in C11 just as a way to provide more control of inheritance. If you're using a version of the C compiler prior to version 11, you can remove the final keyword without any changes to how the program works. The reason that I am including it here is to show you that it exists. The toString method is marked with both virtual and overwrite keywords so that the book's version of toString will be called if a polymorphic pointer of type class item is to a book object, like is being done in main with item star item list. No other changes were made to the book3.cpp implementation file other than removing 3 from the file name or class name. The updates to clothing.h are similar to the ones made to book.h, except that the class definition is not marked with the final keyword. Clothing is not a leaf node because class shirt and class pants are to be derived from class clothing. The toString method is also marked as virtual and overwrite. The only changes to clothing3.cpp to clothing.cpp are removing the 3 from the file name and changing all references from clothing3 to clothing inside the file. The updates to shirt.h are similar to the ones made to book.h, including marking the class definition with the final keyword. Shirt is a leaf node because class shirt is derived from class clothing and it is not permitting any subclasses from shirt. The toString method is also marked as virtual and override. The only changes to shirt3.cpp to shirt.cpp are removing the 3 from the file name and changing all references from shirt3 to shirt inside the file. Pants.h and pants.cpp files 
are not implemented or tested. It is your job to complete this part of the project. Now that the interface and implementation files have been written for all the classes, a main program can be written and tested for the Damazon project. Here's a sample execution. A welcome message is displayed first that identifies the number of different items in the inventory and the size of the shopping cart. Then a list of items available for sale is shown. Now the user can start selecting items. First I choose item 1873 which is the book Darkness at Noon and see that the number of items in stock went from 6 down to 5. Then I choose 2869. Dress shirt and inventory count went from 1 to 0. When I tried to purchase another dress shirt, the sorry out of stock message was displayed. The third item I chose was the book Grapes of Wrath. I entered a 0 for the item number to complete the sale. The shopping cart was displayed and the total was computed and displayed. I ran the program again to verify that messages appeared when a non-existent item or non-numeric data was entered for the purchase request. The algorithm for the project lists the steps needed to process a sale. Even though I had most of the plan in my brain before I started coding, I did make several changes to the algorithm before reaching this final version. I also placed these steps as comments inside the program code. 1. Display the item list and prompt for an item selection. 2. Use a loop to select items and place them in the shopping cart. If the cart is full, display cart is full and exit the loop. 4. Let the user select the item ID for a desired product. If the entry is non-numeric or negative number, display an error and try again. 5. Exit the loop and check out when the user enters a zero for item selection. 6. Search the item list array for a match with the item select entered by the user. 7. If the end of the array is reached without finding the item, display item does not exist. 8. Else, if the item is out of stock, display out of stock message. 9. Else, the item was found and has items in stock. Add the item to the cart. Increment the number of items in the shopping cart. Decrement the number of items available in stock for the inventory. 10. Keep looping until the cart is full or the user enters a zero to check out. 11. Display a list of items in the cart. Calculate and display the total sale. The danazon.cpp file contains the main program. It starts with the pound include statements. The curly brace after main shows constants and variables defined for the shopping cart. The constant shopping cart size is set to a 10. You could change this constant for different size or make it really small to test the program for the shopping cart being full. The item select variable holds the value input by the user when selecting an item to purchase. The item list array holds pointers to each item available for purchase. Since this is an array of pointers, it is necessary to use the new operator to instantiate an object for each item. The new operator returns a memory address each time an object is instantiated. The memory address provided by the new operator is used to fill the array of pointers named item list. The variable item list size holds the number of items in the item list array as was discussed earlier. I see the steps of the algorithm being placed as comments in the code. Three cout statements are used to display the welcome message at the top of the screen when the program starts. A for loop is used to step through the item list array. The for loop starts with i equals zero and uses item list sub i arrow to string to display each item in the list as i is incremented from zero to item list size. Item list sub i selects an entry in the array. The arrow pointer dereferences the operator and then calls the toString method to display the information for the selected item in the list. 
A Cout statement is used to let the user know what is needed to select an item from the list. Here is the part of the program that contains the logic for selecting an item and placing it in the shopping cart. Algorithm Step 2 uses a do loop to let the user select an item and then place it in the shopping cart. The loop ends when the shopping cart is full or the user enters a zero to indicate a request to check out. Algorithm Step 3 compares the number of items in the cart to the shopping cart size. If the cart is full, a message is displayed and the break statement is used to exit the loop. Algorithm Step 4 displays a prompt and reads an integer into the variable named item select. A while loop is used to check that a valid input was made and let the user re-input an item selection if either a non-integer or a negative value was input. The cn.fail flag is set true if a non-integer is entered when trying to input an integer variable. If cn.fail is true or item select is less than zero, meaning a negative value, an error message is displayed and the cn input buffer is cleared and the user is prompted again to enter an item number. Look at the two vertical bars, logical or operator. If cn.fail is true, then the OR operator does not even bother to evaluate to see if the input is less than zero. The test for cn.fail needs to be placed first because there's no point in testing item select less than zero when cn wasn't even able to read an integer from the keyboard. Algorithm step five ends the loop with a break statement if the user enters a zero to checkout. Algorithm step 6 uses a for loop to search the item list array for a match with the item select value entered by the user. If the item select equal equal item list sub item index arrow get item ID statement compares the item select entered by the user to the item ID field of each item and item list array using the get item ID method. If there is a match, the break statement exits the loop, with item index set to the location in the array where the match was found. Algorithm step 7 checks to see if the end of the array was reached without finding a match. Remember that item index will still be set to somewhere in the middle of the array if a match is found because of the break statement. The for loop is coded to keep going and item list keeps getting incremented until the test condition item less than or equal item size is false. Unless a break statement ends the loop early, item index will be equal to the item list size when the loop ends. Therefore, we can use if item index equal equal item list size to see if the end of the loop was reached with the match being found. The item is not available message is displayed if no match was found. Algorithm step 8 starts with an else if statement that only gets tested if we already know that the item was found in the item list array because the if statement in step 7 evaluated to false. Step 8 tests the selected items in stock field using the item list sub item index arrow get in stock to see if there are still items available for sale. If the in stock field is zero, no items are available and the message, sorry, this item is out of stock is displayed. The algorithm step nine, else statement is finally reached when the if statement in step seven evaluates to false and the else if statement in step eight evaluates to false. The block of code attached to the else statement is executed if we found an item and it is in stock. Now we can make a sale. The item from the item list array is copied into the shopping cart. Shopping cart count was initialized to zero when the program started, so the first sale goes into shopping cart array at index position zero. The increment of variable shopping cart plus plus now says that one more item has been added to the cart. We also need to indicate that there is 
one less of the selected item so that it can be tested in algorithm step 8 when another sale is attempted. The see out statement lets the user know that the item was placed in the shopping cart and shows an update of how many items are still in stock. Algorithms 10 says to keep looping until the cart is full or the user enters a zero to check out. I forgot to put a comment for this step in the program. The close curly brace while open parentheses item select not equal zero close parentheses semicolon completes the do block of code started in algorithm step two. We get to the algorithm step 11 when the sale is complete and it is time to check out. A see out statement identifies the number of items in the cart and a variable named total is initialized to zero. A for loop displays all the items in the cart and adds the price of each item to the total using the get price member method for each item in the cart. The total is displayed when the for loop ends. The return statement exits the program. This is the end of the multi-part discussion on object-oriented programming and how encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism are used to implement the Danazon program. I don't know if this program is quite ready to make me a billionaire yet. There are a lot more features that could be added to the program, such as implementing the inventory list using a class and object of its own. I don't have any way of removing items from the shopping cart, compute tax, or ask for payment information, or create shipping labels, etc. I keep thinking of all the other things that could be added that may or may not even have anything to do with explaining object-oriented programming any more than I have already done. Feature creep is a constant danger even in commercial products. Sometimes people and even companies never get to a product release because they keep thinking of more things to add. So I am stopping here because my real goal was to describe object-oriented programming using encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Until next time, bye for now.